in the center. Uh, we have Professor Aram Fernandez from Mediterran East Mediterranean University from Cyprus. He will speak about classifying semigroup properties for integral operators with fourth right kernels. Yes. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Thank you also for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So, it may be not clear from the title, but this talk is another talk related with fractional calculus. And this is a joint work together with two colleagues from my department. Um, I'm going to go to the table of contents. So, I will spend a lot of time just on setting up the problem, because this is this is a recent piece of research that we have done related to some general fractional operators and how to find when a semi-group property can possibly exist. So I will have general discussion to motivate the problem, then setting up the problem, which takes quite some time itself, and I'm going to go quite quickly through the main results and their proofs because uh, I want to spend more time on the explaining the concepts. Okay, so... This relates to perhaps the talks of um, Virginia Kiryakova and Yuri Luchko from last week. They were talking about fractional calculus. So I guess everyone knows already the Riemann-Liouville integral. So this is the basic starting point of fractional calculus. Uh, this is a convolution of your function with this power function kernel. And I want to think a little bit about why this power function is a useful function to take as a kernel, why this is a good definition. There's a couple of standard justifications from the application's point of view. We've seen a lot about applications uh, this morning and on Saturday, and it's a natural generalization of Cauchy's integral formula. So they are a way of explaining why this is a good definition, but I want to think about it specifically in terms of as a convolution operator. So you could define convolution of f with some kind of function, perhaps depending on some parameters, we don't know how many parameters, why is this particular choice of kernel function a good choice to use? Because there's many different definitions. You've seen already in the talks last week, so I won't say much about these. But there's many possible kernels to use, but Riemann-Liouville is the most fundamental and one of the most commonly used. So to justify this, I'm going to go from fractional integrals to fractional derivatives. Once you have already defined fractional integrals, how do you go from there to define fractional derivatives? There's three possible natural ways to answer this question. You expect a derivative to be the left inverse of an integral operator. Derivative of the integral should be the original function. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can also think about taking an integral to a negative order to be a derivative. So, uh, just looking at the definition here, we, uh, sorry, here, we require the order to be positive, <coughs> positive real power. So what does it mean to give a negative order? We can give it meaning by analytic continuation or by saying that um, if you have, let's say, an integral of order one-third and you apply a derivative to order one, you should get an integral to order minus two-thirds, which is a derivative to order two-thirds. So these are three natural ideas for how to go from integrals to derivatives. And in the case of Riemann-Liouville, they all give the same answer. So this is the Riemann-Liouville derivative. It's defined by a repeated derivative of a fractional integral. It is the analytic continuation, integral to order alpha, derivative to order minus alpha, and it is a left inverse. So Riemann-Liouville fractional calculus is somehow complete. You have integrals, derivatives, they fit together, they have natural properties. Probachar is another type of fractional calculus. This is named after an Indian mathematician who defined this integral operator in 1971. So here we use a three-parameter Mittag-Leffler function as the kernel. And again, the fractional derivative is defined as the repeated derivative of the fractional integral. Now, in this Probachar fractional calculus, we have the same nice property that all three ways of extending give the same answer. The derivative is a repeated derivative of a fractional integral, it is the analytic continuation, and it is the left inverse. So this is possible for Riemann-Liouville, it is possible for Probachar, but it is not possible for all types of fractional calculus. So when you go to more general types of kernel function, then these three possible ways of extending can be different from each other, can give different answers. 
So I want to ask why. Why is this possible for Prabhakar? What is the special properties of Prabhakar <coughs> that make this possible? Important property is semi-group. So four parameters of this operator, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, there is a semi-group property in the middle two, in beta and gamma. So that means if you fix alpha and delta, and you take two different values of beta and gamma, then you take the composition of the integral operators, you add the beta and gamma parameters. Uh, so you require beta to have positive real part, but gamma can be any complex number. If gamma is zero, the operator becomes Riemann-Liouville. Why is that useful? Because we know how to find the left inverse of Riemann-Liouville. So if we put together two Rebecca operators with the appropriate orders, minus gamma and gamma, you put them together, you get zero, which is Riemann-Liouville. You can make that to order n, so that is a nth order integral. You apply an nth order derivative, you get the identity. So in this way, we construct a left inverse of the Prabhakar integral, and that is exactly the definition of the Prabhakar derivative. So we have a left inverse property. We also have the analytic continuation property. I think the easiest way to show this is from the series formula. Uh, just using the power series of the Mittag-Leffler function, we get the Prabhakar integral as an infinite sum of Riemann-Liouville integrals. Rebecca derivative is also an infinite sum. It's exactly the same formula, but beta becomes minus beta, gamma becomes minus gamma. So you have the analytic continuation property. So what are the main two ingredients that we use to get all of these three different extensions giving the same result? Semigroup property and series formula. So if we want to reproduce what happens with Prabhakar. So Prabhakar has this magical property that all the three approaches give the same answer for the fractional derivative. We want to get that with some other operator, then we should have these two properties. Series formula is easy. When you have any analytic function in the kernel, fox Wright function, hypergeometric function, whatever sort of general function you want to have, you will get a series formula. Semigroup property is a lot more difficult, and that's what this talk is about. So what I've done up to now is motivating why the semigroup formula, so semigroup property is important. Right? Because it will give a way to extend from fractional integrals to fractional derivatives in a natural way. So let's have a look at the semigroup properties we have so far. For riemann liouville it's an operator with one parameter, it's the fractional order, has a semigroup property in one parameter. For Bacar, four parameters and a semigroup property in two of them. So, in general, what does a semigroup property look like? If we have many parameters, say if we have 10 parameters, is it going to be a semigroup property in 10, in 5, in 2? So we have to think, what does a semigroup property look like in which parameters? Uh, so, before going to set up the problem, I want to think about how to get an integral operator from a special function. Is looking back at the definition of the Prabhakar integral, this is not a convolution of f with simply the three-parameter Mittag-Leffler function. It's a modified function. You have a fractional power inside and a fractional power outside. So why do we modify the function like that? Because the modified function is much more suitable for defining a fractional integral. And the reason is, here's the definition of the three-parameter Mittag-Leffler. Here is the modified one, and this thing that I've highlighted there, that is the h, small h function in the notation of Luchko, which is the kernel of the Riemann-Liouville integral. It has nice properties under uh, differentiation, integration, Laplace transforms. You want the exponent to match with what's inside the gamma function. So if you have something inside the gamma, you should have the same thing minus 1, in the exponent. So that's the reason why we don't use this to define the fractional integral, we use this. Because then the Prabhakar integral, you have an infinite sum of this kernel, so it's an infinite sum of riemann liouville integrals. So you always want the gamma function to match with the exponent of the power. Let's see some more complicated examples. Here is another bivariate function defined by a double sum. We've got two gamma functions in the bottom, so we're going to make a substitution. 
Just like here, instead of t, we write a power of x. So t becomes a power of x, u becomes a power of y, and now we have two powers on the top, two gammas on the bottom, and they match with each other. Okay? So this gamma argument is with this exponent, this gamma argument is with this exponent. So uh, we get a double integral operator, because now it's a function of x and y, so you apply it to f of x, y, double integral, and that's the integral operator you get. But I've written at the top double series, double integral, but those two things are not connected. A double series does not always give a double integral. A single series does not always give a single integral. Here's another function defined by a double series, bivariate function of t and u, but you've only got one gamma function on the bottom. Each gamma function should match with a power, gamma with the power, right? So we want to have one power. But right here we have two powers, power of t, power of u. So we substitute both of them as powers of x, and then we get one power with one gamma function, which is what we want. So here is the fractional integral operator, which is applied just to a one variable function f of x. It is a single integral, double series, single integral. Here is an example with a single series and a double integral. Why is that a double integral? Because you have two gamma functions on the bottom. This is a function of t, but you want to have two powers with your two gamma functions. So you need t to be a power of x times a power of y, and then you get these two gamma functions and two powers, and a double integral applied to a bivariate function. So what we're seeing, all of these, by the way, are nice operators that have semi-group properties, all of these examples, but the number of sums in the series does not necessarily match with the number of integrals in the operator. So what we conclude is that we can use any sort of special function, including bivariate ones, multivariate ones, to define a fractional integral operator, but the number of sums in the power series is not correlated with the number of integrals. Number of sums in the power series determines how many variables the original function is applied to. But then we substitute. Same as with Probacco, we go from t to x to the power alpha. And in that substitution, we can change the number of variables. So how many variables the modified function is applied to, that should be the number of gamma functions in the denominator, and that will be the dimensionality of the integral operator, which also says what sort of functions the integral operator applies to. So if it's a double integral, you need bivariate functions, triple integral, trivariate functions, and so on. So the number of gamma functions in the denominator is very important. Now let's go on to define the general operator that I'm going to consider. So we have the fox Wright function. This is a very general type of special function. It includes Mittag-Leffler, hypergeometric, many special cases. You have an arbitrary number of gammas on the top and on the bottom. P on the top, Q on the bottom, so not even the same number. Uh, but Q is going to be important because number of gammas on the denominator is an important thing. Okay, so this is a single power series, but not necessarily a single integral operator. We can get multidimensional integrals later. Here is our modified function. Okay, this is going to be Q different variables. Instead of Z, we have <coughs> powers of tor1 up to tor Q. We define our multivariable convolution. Okay, so it's a Q-fold integral. It applies to functions of Q variables. This is F of T1 up to TQ. We have a constant multiplier, Q integrals, and this is a uh, Q-dimensional convolution. So now we go from our general function, our general integral operator, and it has also a Laplace transform where all the gammas on the bottom have disappeared. So this is the main question of the talk. What are the conditions to have a semigroup property for this general operator? So this general operator, of course, includes many special cases. For example, Probekar is a special case that has a semigroup property. Other special cases, there are no semigroup properties. Uh, so, what do we mean by semigroup property? For the integral operator, it should be compositional. Take a composition of two integrals, you get a new integral. That means for the kernel function, it should be convolution. For the Laplace transform, it should be multiplicative. 
semi-group property. These are all equivalent to each other. Um, and some of the parameters, which could be any possible selection, so we've got many parameters here. We've got all the little a's, all the big a's, all the little b's, all the big b's, and we've got this delta, it's a constant inside. So that's 2p plus 2q plus 1 different parameters. Could be arbitrarily many parameters. We want to think about having a semigroup property in any subset of those parameters. Uh, so I'm going to give an example which is not a significant or interesting example, but just to show what does it mean to have a semigroup property in some parameters. So as a random example, let's say p equals 3, q equals 2, that means 11 parameters. And let's pick some of them to say semi-group property in these five of the parameters. So what does that mean? It means that here I introduce color coding. So red is for semi-group and blue is for not semi-group. That will help to follow what is going on during this talk. Red is for semi-group. So red little a1, little a1 prime, and you add them together. That's the meaning of semi-group property. If it's a blue one, little a2, little a2, little a2 is the same. Like with Probacar, we keep two parameters fixed, and the other two parameters we add together. So this is the meaning of um, semi-group property in that particular selection of the parameters. But, of course, if you want to have a semi-group property in some of these 11 parameters, then you can have many different selections. Okay? You can choose one, or two, or three, or in as many ways as you want. There are some symmetries that we can take advantage of, but there's still many possibilities. Taking into account that P and Q can be any natural numbers, this goes to uh, infinitely many possibilities. So we have to find some patterns, find some ways to catalog all the options and see what's possible, when it's possible to get semi-group and when it's not. Uh, one more thing to mention, the relation should be true for all values of the red parameters. It's not interesting if we can put this as a value 2, this as a value 3, and that as a value 5 only, because then it's just 2 and 3 together make 5 by coincidence. But if it's always this and this added together to give that, then that's interesting. So the red parameters should be able to take any values, but we can fix some of the blue ones if necessary. So if we say, oh, this is only true when delta equals 1, okay, that's still interesting because fixing one of the parameters just makes a special case, like Probacar is a special case. So, um, I'm going to introduce some notation, it makes the problem a little easier to discuss. The vector of all parameters I will call R, so that is a 2p plus q, 2q plus 1 dimensional vector. Split it into two subvectors, the red one sigma for semi-group parameters, the blue one rho for non-semi-group parameters. So the semi-group property should look like this. Uh, for all values of red ones, blue ones as general as possible, but we can fix them if we need to. So the first steps are easy. I'm not going to even sketch these proofs. It's easy to prove that all the big Bs are in rho, no semi-group. All the little Bs are in sigma with semi-group. Okay, so we can do that by comparing uh, power series for the Laplace transform. That leaves the little a's, the big a's, and the delta still to be catalogued. So before going to the main result, I want to introduce one more thing which is a condition, and this comes with a conjecture that is still an open problem. So the condition CP, P is fixed natural number, and we have two P parameters like this. And we say CP is the condition that this product of gamma functions should be equal to that product for all values of m and n. For example, if p equals 1, we have just two numbers, little a and big A. They should satisfy this relation for all m, for all n. Um, C2 looks like this. Again, for all m and n, four numbers should satisfy that. Now, we think that these conditions are not possible from calculations, from looking at properties of the gamma function, we have not been able to prove it, but our conjecture is that the condition CP is impossible. Now, in the work during the rest of this talk, I'm not going to assume this. I'm going to include CP possibilities, but I'm going to mention that if our conjecture is true, those possibilities are out, because then the result becomes more elegant if this is true. So, 
you know, if anyone has any ideas on how to prove this, we've tried various methods, but uh, it's still open. We didn't manage to prove that this is not possible for any possible fixed numbers that lay in big A. Okay, so... You need to have it for all A, <coughs> small A and big A. No. If there is any fixed numbers, so for example, this could be something fixed and that could be something fixed, some special constants to satisfy this for all M and N. So for all M, for all N, but these can be fixed. But we think that two such numbers do not exist. Let's like big A, there are no possibilities. But you want to use this parameter, as these parameters to have some group property of these parameters? Or these parameters will be no, used? we're not going to use this. Uh, we're going to say that there are some semigroup possibilities only if this uh, condition is satisfied, but it will not be semigroup in the little a and big A in that case. It will be semigroup in another parameter instead. Because the ones without semigroup only can be fixed. Um, yeah, so for all values of all semigroup parameters, but the non semigroup parameters we can fix. For example, maybe something must be 1 to get a semigroup property, or something must satisfy this condition to get a semigroup property. Okay, so let's start on the main problem. We have 2p plus 1 different parameters to consider. We're going to start with the small values of p and work our way up. Some basic properties if delta equals 0, the problem is trivial, reduces to Riemann Liouville. If a big A equals 0, then we reduce from one value of p to p minus 1. So it's also somehow trivial or reductive. It's basically an induction, induction proof, it's going to be. So p equals zero is easy. There's just two, one parameter, delta, two cases. Uh, this one is true, binomial theorem, that one is false. So we have one possibility for p equals zero. p equals one, we've got eight cases, three parameters. Each one can be either red or blue, semi-group or not semi-group. So two to the power three is eight. And I'm going to go through these eight cases one by one to see what happens. Now, in each case, the condition reduces to this should be true for all values of k. Um, so I've introduced this double prime notation because um, if a parameter is blue, then it stays fixed. So blue, we have delta, delta prime, they're all the same. If it's red, then delta and delta prime can be two general numbers. Delta double prime should be the sum of them. So just to make the notation nicer, I've used double prime to mean this. So that's true for all values of k. When you put k equals 0, you just find the value of this constant. When you put k equals 1, is usually enough to get a contradiction in most cases. So I'm just going to skip to the table of results. Yeah. So here's all the eight cases. We went through one by one. Case 1 and case 3 are impossible. Uh, case 2 is only if big A equals 0. If big A equals 0, we go from p equals 1 case back to p equals 0 case, which is already solved. So we ignore that. Case 5, 6, and 7, they can only be true in the trivial riemann liouville case. So again, we can ignore that. It's not what we're looking for. Case 4 and case 8 are the interesting ones. So in case 4, uh, notice that delta is red and both the a's are blue. So if they're blue, they're allowed to be fixed. And this is true if they are fixed to satisfy the condition C1. In case 8, uh, little a is red, big A and delta are blue, and this is true if big A is fixed to be 1. This is the true van der Monde identity, by the way, in case 8. So it's a combinatorial identity. It's a basic thing that lets us prove that it's true in this case. Okay, so that's p equals 1. We've checked all the cases, and we have two possibilities. Either semigroup in these red parameters under this assumption or in those red parameters under the C1 assumption. For p equals 2, five parameters, 32 possible cases. 32 is too many to go through one by one. So we start to use some tricks to reduce the amount of calculation we need to do. Again, there is a condition like this. It reduces to this for all values of k. Putting k equals 0 gives the constant c. Putting k equals 1 is usually enough to get a contradiction. First thing is we want to assume that one of the big A's is red. So if big A2 has a semigroup property, we assume that. For red parameters, they can take any values. In particular, we can set it to be 0, and then we reduce to the p equals 1 case, which is already solved. 
So we know there's only two possibilities in the P equals 1 case, and all of these options give a contradiction. So we get A2 red, contradiction, so A2 must be blue. By symmetry, A1 is also blue. So these two are both blue. Our original 32 possibilities reduce to 8 possibilities. Little a1, little a2, and delta. We assume little a2 is blue. Again, we reduce to the p equals 1 case. And the two possibilities that we already found, they now give two possibilities here. But there is a condition in each case. This is only if c2 holds. And this is only if C1 holds. Again, we use Chu van der Mond to reduce this to C1. So when A2 is blue, we get two options. If A1 is blue, by symmetry, again, we get two options. One of them is the same option. And if A1 and A2 are both red, we get a contradiction. So here is the lemma for P equals 2. There's three possibilities, either one of the little a's or the delta, the semi-group some good property in the red parameters. Now, the general case, here it is as a theorem. I will show the table in a moment. The proof is quite similar to the P equals 2 case. It's an inductive proof. So each possibility considered, we either get a contradiction or we reduce it to the P minus 1 case. So here is the table. This is all the possible semi group properties. And some of them we think are not possible, but this is still very, very few possibilities. We've got a contradiction from everything else. If P equals zero, you can have semi-group in delta and the little b's. There are no a's in this case, because P is zero, there are no little a's, there are no big a's. If P equals one, you can have a semi-group property in the little a and the little b's under the assumption big A equals one. Then I put this double line, so everything underneath this requires a CP assumption. So by our conjecture, these ones below the line should be impossible. But I still list them, because this conjecture is not proved. So for a general P, we have either semi-group property like this. This is in a single AI, or just one little a, or in delta, together with the little b's. So if the conjecture is true, then it's only the top two rows that are possible. So I'll go back to the beginning of the talk. Why are we interested in semi-group properties? Because they give um, a unified model of fractional calculus with integrals and derivatives together. So let's take the p equals zero semi-group case. Here's our integral operator. It has a Laplace transform. And from the form of this, you can see that it has a semi-group. You see these red parameters, they appear as exponents. If it's an exponent, you multiply together, you have a semi-group property, so it makes sense. There is the semi-group property, there is the series formula, and we define the fractional derivative operator. As usual, it is a repeated derivative of a fractional integral. Partial derivative in this case, because it is multivariate. So repeated derivative and left inverse and analytic continuation, and again, all the three possible ways of defining the fractional derivative give the same result. So that is the motivation for why the semi-group property is useful and interesting. For p equals one, similar thing. Again, in the Laplace transform, you can see the red parameters appearing as exponents, and that's why you have a semi-group property. When you multiply together, an a and an a prime will become a plus a prime. Semi-group property, series formula, um, and the corresponding fractional derivative looks like this. So it's an ordinary repeated derivative. It is a left inverse, and it is an analytic continuation. So again, everything fits together. Okay, so let me conclude. Remember the questions that were posed in this talk. What makes a natural, complete model of fractional calculus? integrals, derivatives, cooperating in a nice way. Uh, where can we get a, sorry, when can we get a semi-group property for a fractional integral operator, semi-group property in any possible selection of the many parameters? So the answer to the first question is that what makes a natural complete model? If we have a series formula and a semi-group property, then going from the fractional integral to the fractional derivative 
is uh, all these three possible ways coincide with each other. We also discovered that the dimension of the fractional integral should be equal to the number of gamma functions in the denominator. And so then we considered a very general fractional integral operator found using a Fox Wright kernel. We completely classified all possible semigroup properties in any selection of the parameters. Every time we have a semigroup property, we can construct the fractional derivatives and the complete model. If our conjecture is true, that these CP things are impossible, then a semigroup property can only be possible if P equals 0 or P equals 1. So that means in the Fox Wright function, the top should be either empty or just one gamma function. And if we take the P equals 1 option, the one-dimensional case is exactly per Bacar. You have four parameters and you can check that they are exactly the same as uh, in Probeckel fractional calculus. So basically, the only cases where you can get a semigroup property are Probeckel and the kind of multivariate Probeckel. So Probeckel is very special among all the possible general Fox Wright kernels. Uh, so there is, of course, the open problem of proving this conjecture to make sure that CP is not possible. Another uh, open problem or another direction to extend this work is that when we start with a Fox Wright function, that is a single power series. We turn it into a multivariate operator, but it starts as just one summation. So what happens if you use a double sum? You will get a more general problem, or triple sum or multiple sum. And from working with this, I have again a conjecture. I think I know how the result will look, but Proving this result was already difficult. When we go to multiple series, it's going to be even more difficult. So that is uh, future work in this topic. Uh, so here's a list of references. The one at the bottom, oops, the one at the bottom is the paper where this work was published. So I hope I've finished in time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aaron. Maybe questions, comments? Maybe I can begin with one. Uh, always when you are, you like to apply the Laplace transform to the, the operator because it has semi-group pro uh, semi uh, property, right? And you apply the the semi-group property becomes multiplicative for the Laplace transform, exactly. which is nice. So maybe better don't analyze the, the other side, the Laplace transform, which function has inverse or something like that. Uh, no, well, we have an explicit expression for the Laplace transform as a sum, if it's in this form. Here, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so many slides here. Yeah, so the Laplace transform looks like this. Certainly, so and we, we need to make a few assumptions on the parameters to make sure both that the, this series converges and then that this series converges. But under those assumptions, you can go back and forth between the function and the Laplace transform. Exactly. So it would be no better to analyze which functions can you apply the inverse and then go back. Well, that's what we've done. Like the way that we got the combinatorial relations okay, was from the Laplace transform. So we went from here to here and then reduced it to a combinatorial problem. Maybe do you analyze the semigroup group, semi group property in the in the argument? No, in the in the order, in the argument of the of the operators. Sorry, the slide just yeah. Um, like uh, for instance, you have x. Then if it is maybe not some good property in the in the order, just in the argument. What do you mean the argument? T and then you have x and then t x. What happened? Oh, you mean it's a good property in the variable, like yeah, in the yeah, example at all. Yeah, because it, since it's very useful for some problem. But, but that would not make sense for the n squared operator. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's maybe some special function like this. Yeah, that would be a different problem. So, and, and, and why is this conjecture, let's say C1, it is it's so hard to, uh, to prove? Because one would assume you know everything about gamma functions, so if you want to disprove, you just... Uh, Maybe it's not hard. Maybe there is a trick that we were not able to find, but we worked on it using all different properties of gamma functions and we couldn't manage to do it. Because the problem is that we're not trying to disprove this, this as a general identity. It's obviously false as an identity. 
The problem is that we need to say, do there exist any choice of these numbers, little a and big A, that make this possibly true? And that's, I think, more difficult to show that there are no weird constants to make this true. Is it, is it possible to make true if you, if you set M equal to N? Make it in one variable. Um, I don't remember, but I think I think yes. I think it can be true for some subset of all M and N, but say M equals one. I don't remember for M equals N specifically, but I think maybe yes. It is trivially true if big A equals zero, but that's that's the case to exclude. Like if big A is not zero, is it possible to get this? Um, if m equals n, I don't remember if it's possible then. But you can definitely make this true for some values of m and n, maybe even for infinitely many values, but not for all values. What about growth? Can growth, like if you let m and n become very large, then isn't the second term on the right too fast decreasing for, for, the, for the left guys to catch up? We tried to use Stirling's formula, but I think they both grow at the same rate, or close enough to the same rate, we did not manage to disprove it using growth. Like m plus m factorial is the same as m factorial? Oh, but in Stirling's formula, there's many different terms. Yeah. Like there's an n to the power n, and e to the power n, and square root, and we didn't manage it that way. But maybe if you use a more sharpened version of Stirling's formula, maybe it's possible. I mean, that's why I'm presenting this in front of a bunch of people here who might have some idea that I couldn't find. So if, if you view gamma, I'm just playing, you know, if you view gamma as a factorial, then the right-hand side is like m plus n factorial, and the, the left-hand side is n factorial squared, say the case of the report, which is much less, the factorial square is much less than 2n factorial. Yeah, it looks like that. Um, Yeah, I don't remember why that didn't work when we tried with Stirling's formula. I guess the natural thing to do would be to take logarithms, and then instead of a product, it becomes a sum, and you use the logarithmic Stirling formula, but the first terms in the asymptotic series, I think, were somehow the same. But you're right, it does look intuitively like it shouldn't be, but rigorously, we were not able to prove it. Even without still, you know, m plus n factorial is much larger than m factorial times n factorial. So the first guys involve only the small integers, but the second guy, I mean, the number of factors is the same. But yeah, when you divide them, it's a binomial coefficient, which gets large. Okay, of course, maybe the details are not like that, but it looks like Yeah, yeah, I agree. It looks obvious, so it's frustrating that <laughs> we were not able to prove it. But, you know, I can discuss later with anyone any ideas like this. Yeah, so, let us thank again Aaron and <laughs> So, we have five minutes and we can come back. Do the second